when no one's there, someone's there. You're in a critical situation. Things can go really bad for you. And in the nick of time, somebody stands up for you and turns everything around for you. Have you ever had this experience? I have a question for you. If you are sitting here, in the pew or watching online. The question is this, what if nobody is there to stand up for you? Some of you know that one of my role models in ministry is Pastor Alejandro Bullon. One day he was walking in the rainforest, heading to a remote village, and he lost his ways. And at one point, he was so tired, he was starving, he was exhausted. It was late afternoon, he couldn't go on, he had to sit down, and uh, he rested his back against a log. And uh, in his pocket, he found a piece of paper and started ripping up that piece of paper. And in that process, in his heart, he was praying, Lord, you know, when your servant Elijah was starving, he sat down and he was depressed. And he prayed and you sent him ravens and uh, brought him bread and some uh, protein. That was meat, yeah. And uh, I'm here starving. I have nothing to eat. I feel exhausted. I don't know how far the village still is. Help me. Send me some ravens. And he said, I looked up. Nothing. So I stood up, he says. And after a few painful steps, I, I looked and I saw a little yucca farm. And I said, okay, I might be able to find some food there. So he went there and shouted for help. A tiny little Indian lady came out, very shy. First she hid, then she came again, looked at him, and uh, uh, then she came back with some water. Then again she came with yucca and some white beans. Pastor Bouillon ate. He stood up, got on his feet, and reached the village late that day. After a few days, he was ready to go back home. So one of the young Indian guys offered to go and accompany him up until a certain point where uh, he will reach the river and then he could follow the course of the river and go to his destination. So they were walking and when they reached the area where Pastor Bouillon had that feast the previous uh, week, uh, he said uh, to his young companion, hey, I would like to go there and thank that little Indian woman. And the guy looked at him and said, what Indian woman? There is no woman there. But yeah, there is a little farm over there. And he looked at him and said, Pastor, listen, I'm a hunter. I know this place like the back of my hand. There is no farm anywhere here. Everything is just a wild place. L listen, I ate there the other day, Pastor, believe me. O all right, Pastor Bouillon said, I'm going to go alone. All right, let's go, let's go, let's go. So 
they went there. Guess what? Nothing was there. You can imagine Pastor Bouillon standing there and the young man looking at him and thinking, poor little thing. Hmm. But then Pastor Bouillon said, okay, let me show you something. Because when I sat there, resting my back against the log, I ripped up a piece of paper. See the paper here? Yeah. Now, uh, honestly, you tell me, who was that little Indian lady? Hmm? Well, listen, if you still believe in fairy tales, then she was a fairy. If God doesn't exist, that's all it was. A nice little fairy. But if God exists, then it must have been something else. Or somebody else. Book of Daniel chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and He will deliver us from your hand, O King. But if not, let it be known to you, O King, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, <clears throat> we are here facing your word. And we pray that through it, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you will speak to us in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Daniel chapter 3. It starts with the pride of the king. And then it ends with the praise of the king. In between, you have the faithful threatened and then the faithful tested. The story of Daniel chapter 3 happens at least 10 years after chapter 2. By this time, the teenagers, you know, we spoke about the teenagers. The teenagers are no longer teenagers. I just want to remind you, teenagers don't stay teenagers. So now the teenagers are 20, in their 20s, 20 plus, close to 30. They are well respected, probably high ranking public administrators. King Nabucco, in the meanwhile, he had his ups and downs. That's just life. But still, he, he still has a hard time getting to terms, coming to terms with that dream or nightmare he had had. I am the golden head. Huh. Uh, as good as it sounds, I would like to be more than just the head. I would like to be a king of a kingdom that will last ever lastingly. But how can I reach that? Because I have to deal with these rebellions in my kingdom. Rebellion after rebellion. You know, there are two words in English. One is royalty and one is loyalty. And those belong together somehow. Meaning that lack of loyalty is a threat to royalty. And the king knows that. So he turns to his counselors and asks them, guys... How can we, what can we do to enforce loyalty? And the wise counselors tell him, King, live forever. History says the best way to enforce loyalty is religion. Worship. 
Make them all worship the same thing. All right, that sounds good. So worship what? Because we are polytheists. We worship all kind of things. Listen, you have to build something, a sort of an image. Maybe the image that you saw in your dream or nightmare. Build that image. Bring out everybody to worship that image. Ah, that's a good idea. I'm not going to build an image that only has a head of gold. I will build an image entirely made of gold. I will set it up on the plain of Dura. And that's how the chapter starts. Chapter 3, verse 1 speaks about the king setting up this image in the plain of Dura. It's repeated throughout the chapter eight times. Set it up, set it up, set it up, set it up. And there is a reason, there's a literary device there why it's repeated again and again. You know why? Because the previous chapter ended with this note. And the God of heaven, heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. So the message is this. Oh, the king of heaven wants to set up a kingdom? Uh-uh. I'm going to set up, 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 set up. That's, that's, that's the way humans think. I'm going to set up my kingdom and there will be no stone coming to hit my kingdom and destroy it. And what happens there? Well, the next point is just create that worship event. Bring them all out, all the public officials, not only the central government, no, even the provincial officials, even the king of Judah. Do, do you know who the king of Judah was at, the ta- at, the, at that time? His name is Zedekiah. Even him will bring them all out. And that's what verse, says, verse 3 says, chapter 3, verse 3. Gathered together, we gathered all of them together for the dedication. And the word there is Hanukkah. Does the word Hanukkah say something? All right. Yeah, there are Jews, probably you know some of them, that celebrate Hanukkah. The celebration of Hanukkah started in the second century BC when uh, Antiochus Epiphanes uh, desacralized the church or the temple in Jerusalem, and then uh, the Maccabeans fought against him, drove him out, and then they rededicated the temple. Why am I saying this? Because I want to point out that the Hanukkah, the concept of Hanukkah, is a religious concept. It's obvious that it's not only a political setting, it's a religious setting. So gather them together for a dedication of the image, of a Hanukkah of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Have you ever seen a communist procession? Anybody? A communist procession? Well, in pictures or in video, okay? Everybody's standing in front uh, of something, okay? Everything is very formal, very mechanical, very dry. And then there is a strong voice, the voice of a herald. Okay, that's exactly what's happening here. Verse 4, then a herald cried out aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages. Commanded what? Verse 5. That at the time, right at the time, you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Well, for a non-Jew, that's not a problem. Because people in those days were polytheists. They worshipped all different kind of gods. But for a Jew, somebody that knows the Ten Commandments, for instance, they would know 
that uh, the first commandment and the second commandment is about worship that belongs uniquely, that goes uniquely to God. So you cannot just worship anything. But the crier or the herald goes on, verse uh, 6, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately, the language there is in that very moment, into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. You may think that if that happened, then if somebody did not worship, did not fall down, they, they would take them, put them into some buses, and then drive them to some, fur to some furnaces. Well, that's not the picture. The furnace was there. There are archaeological excavations that revealed that they used furnaces in those days, in that same area, to bake mud bricks. You know what mud bricks are? Okay, bricks like these in the wall, made of mud, and they would throw them into a big, a huge oven, and when it comes out, it looks like a nice reddish brick, right? So they would do that. They would use oil and chaff. They would mix that. They would heat up the furnace and create bricks. Some even say that maybe the statue, which was 90 feet high and uh, 9 feet wide, that's uh, the correspondent of 60 cubits per 6 cubits, somewhat smaller than the Statue of Liberty, that statue, some say, may not have been totally inside and outside of gold, maybe built of bricks and then coated, covered in gold. But there's another role of the ovens, of the furnaces. In those days, there were certain kind of enemies of the kingdoms that they would not kill by sword, they would throw them in the furnace. If you want the biblical proof for, for them, go and read Jeremiah chapter 29. Yeah, there is mentioning about two people there that were burnt by the Babylonians. So can you notice the double possibility for the furnace? So the furnace is there. Now, what is the consequence? Look at verse 7. So because of all of this, all that was said here, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, harp, and lyre, in symphony with all kind of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. You know, you only need an image, a decree, a herald that has a strong, threatening voice, and then some music, and everything because automatic and nonsensical because the herd instinct also kicks in and you just do go through the motion do whatever the other sheep do right and that's what's going on there everybody well everybody really verse 8 therefore because of all of this well, of everything that was happening there at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused. The Aramaic idiomatic expression there, some Chaldeans ate their pieces of the Jews. Yeah, they ate their pieces of the Jews. This is some sort of a verbal cannibalism. I don't know if you, you've ever seen that kind of thing. When somebody has a tooth against somebody else, and they will start biting that person. We don't even know how many exceptions were there. We don't know how many people refused to worship. That, there, there might have been more, because you can imagine a, a huge territory of people there. But these people were under scrutiny, the three, the three Jews. Who were scrutinizing them? Well, you will be surprised. Some of those people that in, that in chapter 2 
were saved by the intervention of Daniel and his companions when the king is in his rage wanted to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And now those folks are policing the event, the worship event, and ah, we got them. We got them and they go straight to the king and look how they bring their stuff to the king. O king, Live forever. Good. You, O king, have made a decree. And, and they repeat the whole decree for, word for word. That everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Now watch. Now watch. Uh -huh. There are certain Jews. It's clear that they already have some prejudice with regard to Jews and those certain Jews. There are certain Jews to whom, whom you have said, okay... You have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So watch what they do. They first bother up the king. Okay? They bother him up, uh, speak to him about his uh, decree, and then, bang, hit him hard. Oh, king, those, those folks you set there, you, you set them over the affairs of the province, they have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. In other words, you trusted people that are not trustworthy. There is something wrong with your judgment, king. Uh huh. And now the king shows his real colors. Because let me ask you, Weren't those young people faithful? Weren't they loyal to the king? Haven't they been around for s quite some time now? Doesn't the king know who they are? But the, the, the passage says that the king was in rage and in fury. Man, something was happening. He is that control freak despot that has no control over his own reactions, over his own temper. And in his anger, you can see the frustration. Because although he is very angry, he's in rage, he's in fury, he's still hesitant for some reason. He's hesitant. How do I know he's hesitant? Go on uh, and see what he says in verse 14. It is true. Is it true? He's, he's asking now. It's really, I mean, truly are you, are you intentional about it? Are you serious about it? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? I mean, really? If you are ready. So he gives them, while the band is still on stage, okay, the band has not left yet. While the band is still on stage, he gives them a second chance. He's hesitant. He knows why. He's got his reasons. Yes, Daniel, one of his very close statesmen, is the best friend of these guys. But, but, but he knows these guys have somebody even higher ranking than Daniel. Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if not... You have this pattern here. If, if not. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately, in the very moment, into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And now he's going too far. Watch this. And who is the God? Ah, he knows what the problem is. So now he turns a, a, a personal altercation, a fight with some statesmen. He turns it into a duel with God himself, right? And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? And to this attack, 
The young folks, the three young people, answer in a certain way. Look at what they answer. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. I have a question mark there. Can you please tell me what is missing there? Oh, they missed his royal title. Pretty, pretty cheeky, right? Yeah, they, they, they are not using his royal title there. They approach him like, like I would approach any kind of human, a, a, a mortal human being, right? Hey, hey, wake up. I mean, by this time, Nabucco, King Nabucco, should have known enough about the God they serve. So he would not go against him the way he's going. But don't think at this point these young men are rebellious. No, no, they are not rebelling. If they were in rebellion, they would not even be there. You understand what I'm saying? Why would I even go? I could stay home. Why would I even go? I don't like that music anyways. Right? I would just stay home, let them worship, do whatever. No, no. That's not their attitude. They are not in defiance against the king. It's not their joy to be there, but they are there because there was a decree. And if there is a decree, they go there. Because they did, did not have a decree from God telling them, you should not even go out. Give Nabucco what belongs to Nabucco and give God what belongs to God. In other words, don't give Nabucco what belongs to God. But don't give God what belongs to Nabucco. I know this sounds a little twisted. It's not. I would, I would imagine somebody say, yeah, you know, I'm going to give it all to God. Nothing to Nabucco. Nothing to Nabucco. Oh, well, wait, wait, wait. That is not faithfulness. That is bigotry. That is called fanaticism. The principle of the kingdom is give God what belongs to God, but give Nabucco what belongs to Nabucco. And it goes on, and now you witness what they say, what they present in front of the king. Please, when you read this passage, don't read it in an angry manner. Like you are doing a repost, an angry repost to what the king said. I remember I, I heard some years ago uh, a child, a preacher child, you know. And he was preaching from this Bible verse. And I really admire children preachers. But somehow somebody must have taught him to preach it this way. He was all angry, all red, and with his finger going like this, like, like, okay? If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. Attitude does matter. You don't want to go in that kind of manner, in that attitude against the king. If that is the case... Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And He will deliver us from your hand, O King. But if not, see the pattern? The king had if, if not. Now they have if, if not. But if not, let it be known to you, O King, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. And this, if not, of the trio, of the young man, brings realism into the story. Because yes, God can intervene. That does not necessarily always mean that He will intervene. Because God is not only almighty, He is not only the one that can do it. 
He's also wise. He's all-knowing, all-foreknowing, and he can decide whether he will do it or not. And the young men know that. And they say, hey, even if he will not do it, we will not go against what we know is right. What we are doing here is not some sort of a barter, some sort of a trade. You do this for us and we do this for you. No, no, no. This is more than that. Here we are talking about a relationship. We are not going to judge our God based on His punctual action. Watch this. If you will start judging God based on His punctual, what He does at one moment, one precise point in time, you will have something to judge, really. You will find something. But if you look at the process and see what God does with what He does in a punctual moment, then the whole perspective is changed. And they know that. Yes, even if He will not, we will not worship, we will not serve your gods. Huh. And now, now the king, what does the king say? Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. Before he was in rage and fury, now he is full of fury. And the expression of his face changed. He was disfigured. Ah. Towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Was his face changed toward those people only? Or toward God, in fact. He spoke and commanded that they, had, they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. Now, I, I don't think you should imagine that they had a thermostat there, and they said, okay, now, seven, okay, good. Give it hard. No, no, uh, the expression there means make it as hot as possible. Heat it up to the maximum possible. I wonder why he does that. Because if, if you want to burn somebody and make it painful for that person, you would prefer slow fire. That's why they burn them on stakes. Because it starts slowly. Right? It comes with pain. But the king is in fury. And remember, in those days, people used to be very very superstitious, you know, mystical. What if something will happen? You know, I have uh, some fire here. What do you think if I, if I will uh, start burning this one? Will burn? Will it burn? Okay. All right, it will burn. Okay. Let me try this. This is just a napkin. Will it burn? Let me try. Do we have sensors? Okay, you know, it, it will. But let me, let me ask you, can I burn this with this? Uh, it's it's going to be hard, believe me. Both because of the content and because it's a roll. Okay, it will be difficult. It will take more time. It will be slow. If I throw it into fire, there's a fire pit there, I throw it into fire. Can I rescue it? Well, it depends on what kind of fire it is if it will catch on fire right away or not. Take some plastic. Huh? Plastic doesn't uh, take flames right away. It will start melting first, right? You may be able to rescue. How about wood? If you throw a, wood, a piece of wood in fire and you have something to pull it out, you will be able to pull it out, especially if it is fire-rated. Right? Fire rated, which means that uh, you can go from uh, a fire retardant, which just slows down the process. Ernie, you should, you should help me here. How is it? Because I, I, I heard uh, firefighters have some gear that they can use for total protection. Is that true? Uh, a certain amount. Ah, that's true. A certain amount of time. Because it's very hard to make something that is possibly submitted to fire and would burn 
make it impossible to burn. It's difficult. But if you are mystical enough, if you believe something can happen and he knows somebody's in picture, then you will make everything possible for you to make the fire as big as possible, as hot as possible. For instance, if I throw my Bible in fire, will it burn? Yes? You know there are stories where everything burned, only the Bible didn't? Huh? Now that changes the perspective a little bit. Yeah, and some people will, will uh, explain, yeah, it was the skin, you know, it's the animal skin that protected the Bible. Yeah, you can go that way. But what if somebody stepped in, you know, because when no one is there, someone is there. So imagine these folks, you know, the king knows they can burn normally, but what if there is a rescue operation in place? like a supernatural rescue operation. So I want them, when they, when they land into the oven, they will be done immediately. And he, he does that. He does that because if you go on, you will see that uh, when they land in the fiery furnace, those that threw them in are devoured. But... There is something in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 14. As messenger of death is the king's wrath, but a wise man will appease it. The problem here is, who's the wise man to appease the wrath of the king? Have you noticed Daniel is not in the picture? Where is Daniel? We don't know. Maybe in delegation. Maybe he was not summoned because not everybody was summoned. Some of the high-ranking officers were not summoned. They were policing. Or maybe he wasn't there. He was home praying for his bodies. You know what I think? If this story was not there in chapter 3, we would have thought, we would have come to the conclusion that everything in the life of these young people was the locomotive. Daniel. As long as Daniel was with them, they had faith. You know, we have that kind of thinking. Even in a church context, when you have uh, somebody that has strong faith, people are around him or her, and take that person out, and then watch. No, no, no. These people, they are on their feet. They are indeed faithful to God. And what happens next? Well, they bind them. As they are. Just imagine, just imagine some, some young man in their formal attire, bound up, and then they throw them in at the upper entrance because the furnaces had two entrances, upper and side entrance. So they throw them in up there, and the king Nabucco can watch the side entrance, the side door, so to speak. And you are there watching with King Nabucco. Can you, can you make that effort? Okay. So what do you see? They have thrown them in. They are killed. I mean, those that threw them in. What happens to these? They land on their souls. And they start walking. Where are the ropes? And not only that. The King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to, the, to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. So then what? Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God, like one of the gods. Some other translations say. You can translate it both ways. So while you are still watching what is happening in the furnace, in your imagination, let me ask you something. Do you think these three young men met Jesus Christ for the very first time there in the furnace? No. They must have been friends, right? 
Because now Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Jesus, He has a name in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. The pre-incarnate Jesus he has, has a name. What is that? Michael. Michael shows up and shows off. He does not only come to, okay, okay, stay there, guys. I'm going to protect you. No, no, no. They show off. They walk. And the king looks like, huh, what? I, I knew something was going to happen. Yes. But let me ask you this. Had they not been friends with Jesus before? Had they not been faithful to Jesus before? Would Jesus have showed up to show off for them? Yes or no? How do you know? Well, there is one answer as to why not. Because had they not been faithful, they would have never landed in the fiery furnace. No? Not true? Yeah. I mean, they landed in the fiery furnace because they were faithful. Had they not been faithful, who would have cared? They would have just bowed down. They would have worshipped. And then the skeptical Christian will come and say, so what? They will not make it to heaven just because of that? What do you think? There is an honest answer to that. But no. That's not the point here. If you want to know the point here, I need two, two young men. Well, actually, a young man and a young lady here next to me. Okay? Two young men. If you are... Uh, okay, uh, Michael is a young man. Yeah, he's a young man. Yeah. Okay. And uh, somebody else. Uh, I think Greg is a young man too, no? <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Let, let, let me, let me uh, show something. Because we have a false conception in Christianity. Quite often when somebody fails, when somebody falls, then the question, the automatic question is, okay, so, so what? They will not make it to heaven? As if all that matters is to get into heaven, to, to make it to heaven. All I want, I even hear it in prayers, Lord, all we want is to make it to heaven. Really? Let me ask you. It's hard to determine which one should be Jesus and which one should be uh, Nabucco. Okay? So, play, play the role of Jesus. Play the role of Nabucco. I'm the negative character here. Okay? I'm the friend of Jesus. That's, that's what I say. Okay? If I'm in a situation like this, is my question, because I, I have Nabucco, I'm under Nabucco, I'm his friend, but my earthly king is Nabucco. So is, is the question really if I will make it to heaven or not? Is that the love-fueled question? No. My question is, what can I do? How can I do my best so that Nabucco, this tyrant, the cruel guy, those that wants to throw me in the fiery furnace, he will know Jesus himself so that he will become a friend of Jesus so that I will not make it to heaven so that we will make it to heaven. You understand the dilemma? Thank you so much, guys. Now you switch around, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Did you get it? When, when, when all we are concerned about is, I'm going to make it to heaven. I don't care about anybody. Let Nabucco go where he wants to go. I want to go to heaven. No, no, that's not Christianity. That's another kind of egoism. That's a self-centered, self-saturated paganism. Yeah, when, when all I want is to, I'm going to get to heaven. Nabucco, forget about it. Don't you see that in all this picture, the point is really in a book? You, you probably remember the story of my uncle, Uncle Wolf. I started my ser first sermon, I mentioned uh, him here, right? 
And uh, you remember probably that he was a public figure. And he was, he was a public figure involved with politics, involved with the communist country, communist party at that time. And he, he had an attraction, a special attraction toward spirituality, even toward the Sabbath, because he had Seventh-day Adventist relatives, remote relatives. So what happens? At one point, my uncle says, hey, when I retire, I will start keeping the Sabbath myself. All right. So there I am. I was a child at that time. There I am waiting, literally waiting for Uncle Wolf to retire so he will start keeping the Sabbath. And then his day of retirement comes, and he plans to throw a big party, you know? It's, it's normal. For a big party, you need meat. You need meat, right. But in a communist country, you could not sacrifice your own animal. You couldn't harvest meat from your animal. You should give it to the communist regime, and they will sell it to you, if they will give something back to you. Okay? So, but he has friends. He's connected. He has all kind of people all, uh, all over the place. So he makes an arrangement with a butcher. The butcher comes to his house. They, they butcher the calf. So now the butcher, with his piece in a bag, he leaves. He's leaving. My uncle accompanies him up to the gate. And when he's there at the gate... He looks out, and on the road, there are two policemen. When he sees them, he thinks somebody reported them, and once uh, they are coming to, to take him. Yeah, you could make it into prison, because just that. And he has a heart attack, he collapses, and that's his final day. And now there's a question. Will he make it to heaven? And the answer to that is, I don't know. But that's not the point. My question is, wouldn't it have been much better if my Uncle Wolf would have stood up and represent faithfully Jesus Christ in that communist setting so that the big shots would see the light shining from a faithful Friend of Jesus? See, see the difference here? The point is, the book of Revelation chapter 13 says that in the final days, there will be something very similar. There will be an image. There will be worship. There will be a decree. Death sentence against those that don't want to worship. Babylon is in view. The number six is involved as well. Okay, so this is, this is a projection for the long run. And some people will say, yeah, I know. I know the furnace is already there. They are using it for baking mud bricks. I'm, I'm, I'm saying it uh, as an illustration. But you will see that one day, they will change their strategy. They will switch the mug bricks with something else. Is that a good picture? Of course, it's a, it's a realistic picture. It's a biblical picture. But let me say something. I believe I may be sleeping one night, you know, have no problem with anybody, and they will just come, they will catch me, and they will throw me into the fiery furnace, and there I will meet my Jesus for the very first time in my life. Is that realistic? Is it? No, it's not. Because if I have not known Jesus before, if He had not been my friend before, if I had not walked with Him before, I will never make it into the fiery furnace. Did you get it now? The fiery furnace is for those that walk with Jesus. I know this is a heavy 
heavy, heavy topic. But it's so realistic. And then we have to finish the story, and we are about to do that. And the satraps, administrators, governors, and the kings of con and king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men and on whose bodies the fire had no power, and hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Interesting. Blessed. Oh, so they came out. And you would expect now that they will preach, they will give some sermonettes. You know who preaches? Who? Did you expect that to happen? The communist guy, the, the despot, the, the, the ruler, he preaches, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Is this a beautiful presentation? Now watch how he has a mood swing. Very specific of uh, despots. Therefore I make a decree that any people, he doesn't know anything about religious li liberty, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of, they will be cut in pieces. Their houses shall be made an ash heap because there's no other God who can deliver like this. Ooh. Nabucco, poor Nabucco, he, he's getting it and he's not getting it. Like any sinner. He's getting it, he's... He's almost there, you know. He recognizes how unique, how excellent this God is. Their God. It's not his God. Yet. Not yet. But he has one more aha moment because of the testimony of the three young men. And the three young men are promoted again. Is it bad to be promoted? Uh-uh, no. Let me quote the third, the fourth young man, the one that was with them in the flame. What is he saying? Matthew 3, Matthew 6, that's 633. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, all the promotions, all, all those stuff, all these things shall be added unto you by His grace. Amen? Amen. Amen.